I'll call to order the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology and welcome you all here this morning for our hearing. Today, the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology will consider draft legislation to reauthorize the Satellite Television Extension and Localism Act. That's the law that governs the provision of direct broadcast satellite service to millions of Americans. Today's hearing follows several previous hearings on the subject, multiple hearings on the communications marketplace, a bipartisan roundtable debate on the issue of the integration ban, and an incredible number of meetings with stakeholders by members of this committee on both sides of the aisle. It's taken an enormous amount of work, but this draft has earned the support of cable, broadcast, and satellite competitors. I especially want to thank Vice Chairman Bob Latta and my Democratic colleague from Texas, Gene Green, on their thoughtful bipartisan work on the integration ban repeal. It's important to note that this provision still requires cable companies to support card Ds. It just gets an outdated, expensive, energy-consuming provision of little or no value off the FCC's books. We believe in spurring innovation, not holding it back. The draft legislation responds to the concerns of members of both sides of the aisle regarding the joint service agreements and sweeps week provisions that seem to put a thumb on the scale. I've listened to those concerns and propose eliminating sweeps week prohibition, which keeps cable operators and not other pay TV providers from dropping broadcast signals during sweeps weeks, the weeks when Nielsen runs its rating analyses. Further, the draft contains a provision that would limit joint retransmission consent negotiation by two or more independent broadcasters in a shared service agreement unless the pay TV provider agrees to negotiate jointly with those broadcasters. I have no complaints with provisions that support fair negotiating tactics for all parties to an agreement. I am, however, very concerned by the FCC's recently announced plans to dump joint sales agreements into their local media ship ownership cal uh, calculations especially without first completing their statutorily required quadrennial review of the marketplace. Up in Fairbanks, Alaska, all four TV stations are operated from the same group of Quonset huts to share costs and create efficiencies that allowed the stations to provide a variety of news and entertainment to this city of a whopping 32,000 people. Absent a JSA, it's unlikely the community could support four television stations. I'd also draw the committee's attention to a recent Wall Street Journal op-ed that includes the community served by the nation's only African-American-owned full-power broadcast station, and I'll introduce that into the record at the end, and by local broadcasters like Bob Singer, the general manager of several local television stations in my district, there is a positive role for consumers in joint service agreements. Unfortunately, Chairman Wheeler is putting the GSA cart before the media ownership horse. Federal Communications Commission is required by statute to review the entire set of media ownership laws every four years. It has consistently failed to follow the law. If a licensee of the FCC failed to follow the law, it would lose its license or be subject to penalty. Chairman Wheeler is forging ahead to regulate JSAs while leaving the Commission's legal obligations for another day. This is why we've included in this draft a clear directive from the Congress to the FCC that it should do its job and finish the quadrennial media ownership review before it tinkers with GSA, JSAs. But in the meantime, we bring fairness to the marketplace when it comes to the misuse of JSAs for retransmission consent negotiations. Our draft finds the right balance. Our work here is set against the backdrop of our larger effort to update the Communications Act and bring our communications laws in line with the innovation and dynamism of the communications marketplace. We hope that many government, industry, and consumer stakeholders in this complex discussion will engage in the comprehensive discussion of the ATCOM Act update. This will be a time-consuming process, however, and as my colleague Mr. Shimkus explained to Politico last week, the telecom rewrite is not for sissies. The video marketplace is not a monolithic structure by any stretch of the imagination. Today's witnesses represent diverse parts of that ecosystem. The broadcasting cable, direct broadcast, satellite, and retail set-top box industries are all well represented on our panel, as well as public interest community. I thank our witnesses for being here today. I appreciate your counsel, and I yield the remaining time to the vice chair of the committee, Mr. Lapp. Well, I thank the chairman. I also appreciate uh, you holding today's hearing. I also thank our panel of witnesses for testifying. Thank you very much for being here. Today we take another opportunity to examine the video marketplace in, con in the context of the Satellite Television Extension Localism Act reauthorization. 
We can all agree that there has been a tremendous amount of innovation and technological advancement in the video marketplace since the Satellite Home Viewer Act, which was enacted in 1988. Since the law was last reauthorized in 2010, we've been witness to an even greater innovation in modern developments. We've seen a proliferation of new entrants into the video market, which has spurred greater investment, job creation, increased competition among video distributors and content providers, and has offered consumers with greater choice and enhanced experiences that are closely aligned with their personal preferences and interests. It is incumbent upon this Congress and this subcommittee in particular to create and support policies that allow the video marketplace to continue to flourish and innovate and empower market participants to the flexibility and efficiently meet the ever-evolving demands of consumers. To fully realize the promise and potential of this industry, we must be willing to remove outdated government regulations that are no longer justifiable and will limit and stifle future progress and advancement if left in place. I want to thank uh, Chairman Upton and Walden for acknowledging the work we've done with uh, Congressman Gene Green on H.R. 3196, and including the proposal to eliminate the integration ban on set-top boxes as a, as a provision in the first draft of the Pristella reauthorization. This represents a positive forward step in updating policies to reflect today's competitive video marketplace and eliminating a regulatory burden to innovation and consumer choice. I look forward to continuing to work with you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Upton, Congressman Green, and other members of the subcommittee on moving this draft reauthorization program uh, package forward. I look forward to the testimony today, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record statements from the National Association of Broadcasters, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, and a joint statement from DISH, Network, and DirecTV in support of the discussion draft as well as letters of support for repeal of the cable card integration ban from the National Black Chamber of Commerce and the Latinos and Information Sciences and Technology Association signing the cost of the integration ban to low-income families. Without objection, so ordered. Now, recognize my friend and colleague from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to all of the witnesses. We're pleased that you're here, and we know that we're going to um, uh, learn a great deal from you. Uh, over the uh, past... Um, uh, year and a half. The message, I think, from uh, industry and consumer advocates uh, to our subcommittee uh, has been uh, pretty clear. Uh, our video laws are outdated, and in some cases, they're even being abused. In 2010, there were just 12 broadcast television blackouts nationwide. In 2013, last year, there were 127. Similarly, uh, retrans fees are expected to more than double from $3.3 billion uh, last year to $7 billion by 2018. Uh, I think that it's pretty clear who the losers are in all of this. Um, it's consumers uh, who can, will continue to see rising cable bills and in most cases will not be compensated when programming, when their programming is blacked out. Uh, some say that this is simply a manufactured crisis, but um, I would ask that the following questions be considered. Why is a law that was intended to promote localism being used to block national cable programming or content that's available free on the Internet? Why does the law prohibit cable operators from taking down a broadcast signal during a Nielsen's uh, sweeps week Yet there's no such prohibition for a broadcaster that pulls their signal during a retrans dispute. And why, when a consumer simply wants HBO, does the law require that they also pay for retrans stations that are available uh, free over the air? I think that these are some of the uh, critical questions um, that led me to introduce the Video Choice Act in December and a chorus of support. Uh, I might say strange political bedfellows uh, came together from constituents to pay TV providers to independent programmers uh, to think tanks and to consumer groups to undertake targeted video reforms and do so as part of the reauthorization of Stella. I think we have to work together in a bipartisan way, just as Representative Scalise and I have done over the past uh, several months. Uh, unfortunately, several of the provisions in the discussion draft do not embody the bipartisan values that have been the cornerstone of previous uh, uh, reauthorizations. We have to be forward-thinking, uh, both in our approach to legislating 
and, uh, and when we are going to dismantle something, which there is a provision in the draft that does so, uh, that has helped to ensure that consumers can buy cable set-top boxes from someone other than their local cable company, we have to have an eye on the future. Before we dismantle, we should establish a framework for the future. And I think that this is something that we all need to think long and hard about. I'm also concerned by a provision that would effectively bar the FCC from modifying its rules to close the loophole that broadcasters have been exploiting to circumvent the FCC's media ownership rules. I find it contradictory that while the draft bill appropriately recognizes the anti-competitive nature of joint retransmission consent negotiations, it also gives tacit approval for other forms of coordination among broadcasters, so long as it's not done at the expense of the cable and satellite operators. I, I think we can do better than this. Uh, in closing, Mr. Chairman, you know that I have said before, and I will continue to say, uh, that we work together. Uh, not only with me, but with uh, all of my colleagues on this side of the aisle to eliminate or redraft the provisions I've highlighted to support consumers, competition, and innovation across the video marketplace. And with that, I would like to ask unanimous consent to place into uh, the record uh, uh, two letters, uh, one from uh, CCIA and the other from a, um, a consortium of... Um, um, it's Free Press, Consumer Action, Public Knowledge, uh, Writers Guild of America West, um, uh, a Tech Company Alliance, et cetera, et cetera. It's a lot of good people. So with that, uh, um, I don't think I have any time yeah, left, do. do I? Without objection, they'll be entered right. in the record. Uh, I do have 35 seconds if there's anyone that would like to use the remainder of my time. Doris, you want to wait for someone else? Okay. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lee yields you. back the balance of her time. I thank the General Lee for her comments. Now recognize the Chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming today to discuss this draft of this must-pass legislation. More than a million and a half satellite TV subscribers rely on the provisions of Stella that expire at the end of the year, and the draft legislation that is subject of our hearing will ensure that these subscribers continue to receive the services that in fact they have come to rely on. There's been a healthy debate, yes there has, over what this reauthorization should and should not do, and we welcome continued input as the process moves forward. And we wanna work to reauthorize Stella. It's important to remember that this is not the venue for comprehensive reform. As you know, the committee has embarked on a multi-year effort to update the Communications Act, and this process will be driven by a thorough and thoughtful review of all aspects of today's communications marketplace with the goal of updating our laws to better reflect today's realities while leaving the flexibility necessary to foster continued innovation and growth. And we hope and expect that you all will be very active participants in that process, as I know that you will want to do so. Thanks to the hard work of this subcommittee and input from the public and industry stakeholders, Chairman Walden issued a discussion draft that offers practical, narrow reforms to the current video market while properly leaving comprehensive reform to the hashtag ComAct update. I strongly support this draft and encourage others to do so as well. In addition to extending the expiring satellite provisions, today's draft also makes several targeted pro-consumer reforms to video laws and regulations. It repeals costly FCC rules that, requ that require cable card and set-top boxes leased by cable companies. It removes a government guarantee of sweep sweep protection and retransmission disputes. And it takes action to ensure that the FCC meets its statutory obligation to review and deregulate media ownership rules before attempting to take additional regulatory actions against sharing agreements. The draft also helps to keep negotiations fair between broadcasters and pay TV providers for retransmission consent. So these are, I think, well-considered deregulatory reforms, the type of intelligent reforms that the committee and this Congress should think about during the hashtag Com Act update. I yield the balance of my time, one minute each, to Mr. Scalise, Barton, and Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This very modest Stella draft we're reviewing today begins to address some of the outdated provisions shackling the video marketplace. But I think there's a lot more work to be tackled in this area before we can say that we got the public policy right 
and that we leveled the playing field for our consumers back home. I know many in this city on all sides of these issues are fearful of what a marketplace based predominantly on copyright law would look like. But as long as we have this government manipulated market with its compulsory licensing, carriage regulations, and consumer purchase mandates, it is completely reasonable to suggest, as Ranking Member Eshu would also agree, that these outdated laws be updated over time. This is not a free market at work. It is a government creation. We should never stop championing the belief that consumers will stand to gain the most when we allow our nation's innovators, entrepreneurs, and risk takers to show Washington the way, not the other way around. I look forward to continuing to embrace this unique opportunity to bring, that brings together members from both sides of the aisle and hopefully both sides of the Capitol as we collectively work to modernize the decades-old laws and regulations that foreclose on the possibility of freedom for all market participants and greater consumer choice. I look forward to hearing from our panelists, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman, there is uh, nothing like renewing old acquaintances for members of this subcommittee uh, than scheduling a legislative hearing. And as I look out in the audience, I see a number of my old friends who have called me or made an attempt to touch base since uh, you scheduled this hearing. We've got two former congressmen of the subcommittee, Mr. Bass of New Hampshire and Ms. Myrick of North Carolina. We're glad to see them. Uh, I was here, Mr. Chairman, in 1988 when we passed the Satellite Home Viewer Act, and I've been here for all the reauthorizations. Uh, I think it is imperative that we reauthorize it again this year since it expires at the end of December of this year. And I think the discussion draft has uh, uh, required a, a lot of input, has received a lot of input, excuse me, and I think some of the changes that have resulted from that input are positive, and I look forward to the hearing with that. Mrs. Blackburn is not here, so um, I will yield back to the chairman unless the chairman wishes to yield to one of the other members. That Any other member want to use up the remaining 34 seconds? If not, the uh, gentleman yields back the balance of his time. We'll now turn to the uh, ranking Democrat on the committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for uh, five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're here today to discuss draft satellite television legislation released by, released by Chairman Walden last week. I'm not prepared to support the bill in its current version, but I'm prepared to work with Chairman Walden, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Eshoo to get a bill we could all stand behind. Last night, the House unanimously passed the FCC Process Reform Act. It took work to get that bill in a shape that every member of the House could support. But if we were able to bridge differences in the FCC process bill that were much bigger than we face today, I'm hopeful that with goodwill on both sides we can reach the same result on this issue. My initial preference was for a clean reauthorization of the expiring provisions of the Satellite Television Extension and Localism Act, or STELA. Previous authorizations may not have been clean, but the new provisions that had been added were part and parcel of the purpose of the law, giving satellite subscribers access to local and network bro broadcast programming. Today we're considering a different kind of bill. It would make changes to the way retransmission consent negotiations may occur by altering the bargaining power between programmers and distributors. It would also hamstring the FCC's ability to address broadcaster coordination that could undermine the diversity of voices and lead to job losses. And we would repeal set-top box regulations that don't even apply to satellite companies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I can understand the draft bill prohibiting broadcasters' coordination in retransmission consent with limited exemptions while condoning similar co coordination of uh, broadcasters jointly sell add time or otherwise coordinate outside the retransmission consent pr process. Uh, that's what this bill would do, and I find the two approaches difficult to reconcile. Uh, I believe much of the bill it passes a public interest test, but not every provision. I support FCC's tightening its attrib uh, uh, attribution rules to address joint sales agreements between television stations, uh, I don't understand why the same standard wouldn't apply that we are applying to anti-competitive behavior among broadcasters that results in consumer harm and retransmission consent negotiations. 
to also apply to joint agreements that have a well-documented history of increasing prices, reducing competition, and otherwise undermining the public interest. The set-top box uh, issue is also one we need to examine closely. Some energy experts believe the cable card requirement is preventing the design of more energy efficient set-top boxes. If that's a real concern, I'd like to see it addressed. But at the same time, we need to make sure we're preserving competition and innovation in the market for set-top boxes. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the bill uh, uh, has uh, been handled well. It's a bill we can work with, and I'm hopeful that we can reach a full agreement on all the provisions. I want to close by thanking Chairman Walden for his efforts and for this hearing today. I hope we can work together to develop a truly bipartisan satellite reauthorization bill, and I want to yield uh, at this time to, the, to my colleague from California, <coughs> Ms. Metsui. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Waxman, for yielding me time. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding today's hearing, and I'd like to thank the witnesses for being here today. I'm pleased that we're beginning this legislative process to renew satellite television distance signal and license. However, I am surprised that unlike the past, our legislative starting point is not a bipartisan, narrowly tailored bill. Now that the bill has expanded, I do look forward to hearing more about the merits of the provisions relating to retransmission consent and set-top boxes. We know that technology is disrupting the video marketplace with new and innovative ways to watch TV and stream movies and videos. As a result, we're seeing new players enter the marketplace, and we are seeing trends toward more consolidation. However, one thing is certain. Americans are tired of being caught in the middle of retransmission disputes. That is why, since the Stella proposal has expanded, I believe we should look at this bill through a filter. And that is, <coughs> will it put the consumers in a better place? It is my hope that we can definitively answer that question. Moving forward, it is my hope that this subcommittee can work in a bipartisan manner to improve the bill and produce a bipartisan product. And I yield back the balance of my time. General Lee yields back the balance for time. All time has uh, now expired. And we will uh, get on about uh, hearing from our witnesses. Um, and I want to thank them all for, uh, for being here. And we're going to start uh, <coughs> with Mr. Mike Palkovic, did I say that right? Palkovic, yes, Executive Vice President, Services and Operations of Direct TV. Mr. Palkovic, thank you for being here today. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Mike Palkovic, and I am the Executive Vice President of Operations at Direct TV. Thank you for inviting me back to testify on stellar reauthorization. Stellar reauthorization is critical to millions of your constituents who depend upon DirecTV. Without congressional action, key provisions expire this December. The committee and its staff have put many hours to produce the first discussion draft of legislation that would reauthorize these provisions. So my first and most important message is simple. Thank you. DirecTV and our subscribers appreciate your hard work and your willingness to address stellar reauthorization. You may have heard from some companies telling you what you should or should not have done with the discussion draft. Some may even be telling you to do nothing or to simply change the expiration date in a, quote, clean reauthorization, something Congress has never done before. This, however, is the Satellite Home Viewer Act. I am here on behalf of the nation's leading satellite provider to say that we agree with the committee's approach. Does this discussion draft contain everything DirecTV thinks it should? Of course not but it does two critically important things. First, it preserves service for millions of distant signal subscribers. With all of the other issues before this committee, it's sometimes easy to forget that key distant signal provisions are due to expire this December. Your constituents, however, have not forgotten about these provisions. More than a million and a half subscribers, many in the most rural areas of the country, receive at least one distant network signal from DirecTV or DISH. Were Congress to fail to reauthorize Stella, these subscribers would lose service that most Americans take for granted. Second, the draft bill addresses one particularly egregious abuse of the FCC's rules 
that is raising prices for consumers. Reasonable, pe reasonable people can differ on the broader policy questions that divide broadcasters and pay TV providers. For example, broadcasters think our subscribers don't pay, pay them enough for their programming. And we wish broadcasters would pay us for delivering their signals to millions of our subscribers who would never be able to get them over the air. Whatever one's views, however, most people agree that you shouldn't be able to evade FCC rules. Yet this is exactly what broadcasters are doing today, and this is exactly what the discussion draft would stop. Broadcasters increasingly negotiate retransmission consent jointly on behalf of two, three, or even four network affiliates in the same market. This leads to higher prices, as much as 161 percent higher, according to one estimate, and it leads to greater harm when blackouts occur. This is why the FCC appears poised to follow the advice of the Department of Justice by restricting joint retransmission consent negotiations for non-commonly owned stations in the same market. The committee's discussion draft takes the same approach. We think this is sensible and long overdue reform. So on behalf of DirecTV's more than 20 million subscribers, I'd like to thank the committee for its diligence and hard work on stellar reauthorization, particularly Chairman Walden, Congressman Scalise, and Congresswoman Eshoo. We look forward to continuing to work with Republican and Democratic members of this committee as we move forward. I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Mr. Polkovic, thank you very much for your testimony. Well, I'll go to uh, Marcy Burdick, Senior Vice President, Broadcasting for Shures Communications Incorporated. Ms. Burdick, it's good to have you back before the subcommittee. We look forward to your testimony. You just need to turn that microphone on. You think the broadcaster could get the microphone. Thank That's you. That's all right. It's all right. Good morning, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Marcy Burdick, Senior Vice President at Shures Communications. I supervise radio, cable, and television stations in small and medium markets. I'm testifying on behalf of the NAB, where I'm the television board chair, and pleased to be here this morning with the two Michaels and the two Matts. The Stella legislation that the committee is considering is, at its core, a satellite bill. Passed in 1988, this law was supposed to be a temporary fix to help satellite carriers better compete with cable by giving them permission to provide distant, broadband, uh, distant broadcast channels. 26 years later, satellite is providing local broadcast channels in nearly every market and is a thriving competitive alternative to cable. So while NAB questions the need for the bill at all, we can support the draft produced by Chairman Upton and Chairman Walden. Our primary interest in the legislation was to prevent the picking of marketplace winners and losers, which is why we've asked for a clean bill. We're happy to see that this Stella draft steers clear of these kind of provisions. While cable and satellite companies sought to use Stella to gain leverage over broadcasters in retransmission consent negotiations, we continue to believe that free market negotiations are the most appropriate place to establish price. As to any other broader changes to broadcasting rules, NAB firmly believes that those should be debated as part of the Comprehensive Communications Act update recently launched by Chairman Upton and Walden. As you know, broadcasters may only operate with a license granted to us by the FCC, and we are by far its most regulated industry. It can be hard to flip a switch without getting permission from your regulator. And while our competitors are often large national companies with no ownership restrictions, we may not own, in most cases, more than one TV station in most markets. While our competitors may show provocative, cutting-edge content at any time of the day, broadcasters live by decency rules dictating what we may air. Broadcasters are saddled with innumerable regulations that are by far more onerous than our cable and sat satellite competitors. For all of these regulations, there are some benefits that broadcasters receive because we do operate in the public interest. But if Congress opts to remove the benefits of being a broadcaster, then it should also remove the burdens. Deregulation should not be limited to one player in an industry. If your goal is regulatory parity between the various video platforms seated at this table, a comprehensive examination in the Communications Act update is the only way to achieve it. I'd like to spend the remainder of my time addressing uh, joint sales agreements known as JSAs. 
These are agreements among broadcasters in a market for the joint sale of advertising. While often mischaracterized, these agreements benefit the public, particularly in small and medium markets where Shures operates. They result in additional local news, improved public service, and enhanced transmission facilities. For example, our JSA in Wichita, Kansas, supports the only Spanish local newscast in the state of Kansas. In Springfield, Missouri, our JSA helped take a struggling station to one that is winning national awards for local news coverage. We strongly oppose the extraordinary regulatory path the FCC is taking to make JSAs attributable for the purpose of the broadcast ownership rules. The FCC's proposed rule will require broadcasters to unwind existing agreements, something unprecedented and amazingly disruptive. This is yet another example of how broadcasters are forced to play by one set of rules while the rest of the video industry plays by another. And the real issue here is competition for local advertising dollars. Television stations fiercely compete not just with each other, but with cable, internet, and mobile. Although the FCC and DOJ have said broadcasters dominate local advertising, you can see in this chart that we've put on the wall that we are seeing and expecting big gains from our competitors. The chart proves that today's local advertising market is by far more than just local TV, but unfortunately we're being regulated like it's 1960. And importantly, for all of those entities taking revenue out of a community, local broadcasters are the only ones putting it back in through local news and community service. Strangely, the FCC apparently doesn't have the same sales concerns as it relates to cable. The same JSA-like agreements called interconnects are routine between cable, satellite, and telcos for the joint sale of advertising. What you have are cable companies selling local advertising for their direct competitors, yet they will continue unregulated. In conclusion, we strongly support the bill's language that prevents the FCC from enforcing rules without first collecting empirical data studying the real-world impact of JSAs. In reality, these agreements better serve the public interest. To ignore the market pressures facing broadcasting would doom us to the fate of newspapers, and I hope this committee will take an honest, fact-based look at the importance of these agreements to localism. We appreciate the hard work of this committee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Burdick, thank, <clears throat> pardon me, thank you for your uh, presentation. We'll now go to uh, Mr. Michael Powell, President and CEO of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Mr. Powell, it's good to have you back before the committee. We look thank forward you, to your Chair. testimony. Thank you, Chairman Walden, and um, thank you, Ranking Member Eshoo and other members of the subcommittee. It's always a distinct pleasure to have the opportunity to come and testify before you today. Uh, I'm pleased on behalf of the National Cable Telecom Association representing America's cable companies to support reauthorization of Stella, including the very important requirement for companies to negotiate broadcast carriage agreements in good faith. We're also specifically pleased to support the carefully selected video reforms that have been included in the discussion draft. All these reforms can be appreciated as both, one, directly benefiting consumers, and two, restoring a modicum of competitive balance among companies, both of these themes should always be touchstones of communications policy. Let me turn first to the question of the integration ban. Eliminating the integration ban, an effort led by Congressman Ladd and Green on a bipartisan basis, reverses an ill-conceived FCC policy. While clearly preserving the statute and its commendable objective of promoting consumer choice, innovation and competition in set-top boxes, something long championed by Congresswoman Eshoo. To implement the law, the FCC had to overcome a simple obstacle, giving third-party boxes access to encrypted signals. Industry worked together to create a separate security module, the cable card, so boxes could be sold unlocked at retail and work in any cable market by simply acquiring a card. Cable card is now a fully realized solution. The FCC, however, stepped beyond the statute and imposed something called the integration ban. The ban forced cable companies to pry security functions out of their leased, box, leased boxes and rely instead on cable scards, despite there being no technical need to do so. The theory of the rules was behavioral, not technical. The belief that cable companies would now have an incentive to create, deploy, and support cable cards for third parties. The FCC also, in a bit of industrial engineering, hoped to push consumers toward third-body boxes by eliminating 
a low-cost choice from the cable company. This ill-fated policy should be re reversed simply because its costs now clearly outweigh its speculative benefits. For one, the integration ban eliminated a low-cost consumer choice, costing consumers nearly $1 billion in unnecessary expenses. According to FCC data, the integration ban adds over $55 of additional cost per box while adding no additional functionality. Secondly, the ban is quite wasteful of energy, imposing on consumers the cost of hundreds of millions of unnecessary kilowatt hours per year. Third, the policy unfairly tilts the competitive playing field. As was mentioned by uh, Chairman Waxman, the integration of ban applies only to cable companies. Despite them representing only about 50% of the market today, down from over 90% when the provision was passed. DirecTV and DISH, ABLE competitors, are the second and third largest providers and are free to innovate and develop lower cost alternatives since they're not subject to the rules. The same is true of telcos like AT&T. This incongruous application of the law has no defensible rationale and it's impossible to believe a policy applied to barely half of a national market will have much impact on a national market for set-top boxes. And whatever the meritorious intentions of the integration ban were, the benefits are speculative at best. Today, 44 million cable customers have chosen leased cable boxes that used cable cards. In stark contrast, only 600,000 cable cards have been requested for third-party devices. The explosion of unimagined video devices and content sources from the likes of Roku, Apple TV, Xbox, Chromecast, and a wrath of Apple, iOS, and Android devices is exciting and likely explains lessening interest in cable set-top box alternatives and points squarely to a market developing solutions to meet consumer preferences. Finally, a word about joint negotiations from broadcasters. We support the effort to rein in abuses of local broadcast stations that have intensified the use of so-called sidecar agreements to jointly negotiate carriage of their signals. Whatever the purported efficiencies of these arrangements are, and there may be some, they have no place in validating the anti-competitive practice of competitors acting collectively to negotiate prices. As the Department of Justice has found, these practices harm consumers in the form of higher cable prices. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to your question. Mr. Powell, we appreciate your testimony, and we'll now go to Mr. Matt Zinn, Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Chief Privacy Officer for TiVo. Mr. Zinn, it's good to have you before the subcommittee. Yeah. We look forward to your comments. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, members of the subcommittee, my name is Matthew Zinn. I'm the Senior Vice President for TiVo. TiVo developed the first commercially available digital video recorder, and we have um, over 4 million subscribers worldwide, including a million subscribe to retail subscribers in the United States. We, I appreciate the invitation to testify before you today. Ordinarily, TiVo would not be giving its opinion on legislation. Mr. Zinn, uh, Anna, I wonder if you could pull your microphone up just a little closer. Yeah. Is this better? Oh, much. Thank you. <laughs> Ordinarily, TiVo would not be giving its opinion on legislation to reauthorize compulsory licenses governing the satellite industry. Our business has little to do with Stella. I am part of this panel only because of a completely unrelated provision that was attached to the Stella reauthorization legislation pushed by a cable lobbying group to eliminate choice in how consumers watch cable programming. TiVo stands for consumer's choice. It's what we do. I'm not here to criticize cable, but certain interests within the cable industry, like this guy, are trying to undermine competition and choice. The provision would repeal the pro-competitive requirement that operators use the same security standard in their boxes as they make available for retail. That's what this is about the same security standard. Common reliance on the same security standard is a principle the FCC has repeatedly found is a necessary component for a retail market for set-top boxes to emerge. Seeking its repeal is an aberration of cable's generally pro-competitive policy approach. Cable originally provided competition to broadcast networks. Cable has provided competition to telephone networks and to data networks, and cable did not oppose the original Stella legislation that enabled satellite competition to cable. This provision is also an aberration in terms of how all comparable industries are treated. Consumers should be able to use whatever device they choose 
to access video programming just like they can use whatever computer, telephone, cell phone they want to use to utilize internet or wireless networks. Video is no different. The Energy and Commerce Committee has been the catalyst for this competition no matter which party has been in control. In 1996, this committee had the wisdom to include in the landmark Telecommunications Act a bipartisan provision to unlock <coughs> devices through which cable subscribers can get their channels. The concept was simple. Consumers should have the ability to purchase a set-top box at retail and not have to rely on renting a box from their cable provider. This provision was intended to do for the video device market what the Cardiphone decision did 45 years ago for the telephone industry and what Congress is doing right now for consumers with wireless devices. Allowing consumer choice to be undermined stands in opposition to what this committee has stood for purely because a lobbying group has asked for provision to be attached for legislation. I'm not here to defend the status quo, far from it. We share the cable industry's desire to move on to a new security standard and we want to work with the industry to find the next generation answer. But passing legislation eliminating cable operators' incentive to support retail boxes without putting a replacement solution in place is the most twisted approach given the heritage of the cable industry and the heritage of this committee in creating choice. My fellow witness who is representing the industry here today called TiVo God's machine because of the choice and control it gave the consumer. It is ironic that he is now leading the charge to kill this type of consumer choice simply because he's wearing a different hat. TiVo is in no position to advise the committee on the length of the satellite compulsory license or on retransmission consent. Rather, I am here to say today that a provision that will undermine the retail market for set-top boxes and deprive consumers of choice has no place in a bill originally enacted to give consumers choice in video providers. The committee should be focused on fostering competition rather than undermining competition and choice. This committee has always stood for competition and choice and for fostering free market solutions where those can suffice. This committee can play a strong role on this important pro-competition and consumer choice issue by supporting a process that puts in place a more efficient market solution worked out between the industries. There are already companies who have indicated they have a desire to work with us to do just that, but the 629 amendment will kill that process by taking away the incentive for the industry to work out that next generation solution. Such an amendment stands the very heritage of this committee on its head because of the lobbying efforts of a contingent of the cable industry, an industry that has also traditionally stood for competition and consumer choice, an industry that TiVo is helping lead the way to the next generation of television, and an industry now led by a man who, when he was the FCC chairman, made very clear how important TiVo was to the future of the video marketplace. I respectfully urge you to support innovation and consumer choice and remove the amendment to Section 629 from the Stella Reauthorization Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Zinn. I assume you're opposed to that amendment. Mr. Wood, Mr. Matt Wood, Policy Director of Free Press, we're delighted to have you back before the committee. Please go ahead with your testimony. Thank, thank you, Chairman Walden and Ranking Member Eshoo and esteemed members of the subcommittee, and thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Matt Wood, and I'm the Policy Director for Free Press, which is a nonpartisan organization with more than 700,000 members across the country. Free Press works for policies that promote competing sources of news and journalism, because they're so important for informing our nation's democracy and powering our economy. Unfortunately, the discussion draft could contribute to the ongoing loss of such competition. My testimony focuses on section four of that draft, which would keep the FCC from addressing undue media concentration and removing entry barriers for broadcast businesses. I will also talk briefly about section six, which would keep the agency from following Congress's direction to increase the choices that people have for set-top boxes and other video devices. Our media should reflect the full range of experiences and ideas this country has to offer. It's essential to see different viewpoints and hear different voices on the dial, even if they disagree, or rather because they disagree, because robust debate and in-depth coverage keep our republic strong and free. This applies at the national level and at the local level too, where broadcasting remains a vital source of information about our government and our culture. Television remains the dominant way that Americans get news. Seven in 10 people in the US watch local TV news, almost double the number that watch cable news or get news online. But the question is, what kind of news are they getting? The answer for too many Americans is they get two or more broadcasts produced by the same company. Sometimes this outsourced news comes from separate news teams. 
And more often, stations have the same reporters, air the same stories, and use the same scripts on two or more channels. In either case, it's the same owner calling the shots. Some broadcasters say this type of sharing keeps multiple newscasts on the air. They claim, oddly enough, that the only way to have competing news is for stations to stop competing. Let's be clear, when you hear about synergies that make news more attractive to produce, there are just two ways to save money, cutting overhead and cutting jobs. So one person's efficiency can be another's unemployment. And that's a hardship that affects us all when people losing their jobs are journalists we depend on to dig into the facts. Slashing newsroom jobs can happen slowly, as a broadcaster like Sinclair reduced its average number of employees per station by more than 20 percent. That was 55 per station in 2001, down to just 43 today. Or it can be tonight's top story. In late 2010, the anchor at KMSB in Tucson took to the air to report the layoffs that hit him and 50 of his colleagues. What makes it worse is this runaway consolidation happened right in front of the FCC for years, clearly violating its ownership limits. Section 4 of the draft refers to the local television multiple ownership rule, which permits direct or indirect control of more than one station per market only under certain circumstances. Yet in more than 100 markets, almost half of the TV markets in the whole country, broadcasters use these outsourcing arrangements to violate the letter and the spirit of this FCC safeguard. They do this with joint sales agreements, or JSAs, shared services agreements, and a litany of others, Combined, these management agreements often transfer control and the bulk of the affected station's revenues away from the supposed licensee. These outsourcing deals often prop up shell companies that take away opportunities for competing businesses. As a rule, the FCC shouldn't stand for them. Last month, the Department of Justice told the FCC that such covert consolidation can harm competition. Last week, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler called for a vote to treat JSAs above a certain threshold as what they are signs of ownership by broadcasters who, who the, by the broadcasters who really run these stations. That would align the FCC with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which doesn't fall for the fiction that these are independent owners. Investors get the truth, and operating stations must treat their so-called sidecar companies as subsidiaries. Even that nickname, sidecar company, shows how much they're driven by conglomerates like Gannett, Nexstar, Raycom, Sinclair, and Tribune. Section 4 could keep the FCC from moving ahead with its plans to clean up this practice and prevent unlawful transfers of control. Just a quick word on Section 6 as well, and I won't point to this guy, but I agree with much of what he said. Section 6 could also reduce choices for viewers, and as Mr. Zinn explained, the integration ban promotes competition for set-top boxes, which incumbents now charge you up to $20 a month just to rent. Cable customers, of course, should be free to take them up on that offer, but they should have other options too. And they shouldn't believe cable claims that blocking innovation by others is itself a form of innovation. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your question. Mr. Wood, thank you for your testimony. I'm going to make a couple of comments, and then I've got some questions. I would just say, having been no secret in the broadcast business, having had a JSA, they can also be positive in the market, too. Uh, when you take over stations, when you try and group up, and we actually, as a result of one and a purchase, were able to restore news. And I'm trying to figure out how JSAs have gutted newspapers. There's something going on out in the marketplace uh, out there with newspapers. That they're not in a JSA situation. And newsroom after newsroom in the printed press is being gutted. And I'm really frustrated with the Federal Communications Commission and the fact that they don't step up and do their job as required by statute, by the law, to do their ownership review, look at cross-ownership so we have a strengthened voice out there of First Amendment writers. And so um, it's just really frustrating because you can cite all these statistics, but on the ground, when you're meeting the payroll, when you're trying to make things work, there's a lot of other things that come into play. So, Mr. Powell, this draft will relieve cable and their consumers of a significant cost burden, the cost of making lease set-top boxes compliant with the integration ban. There's been a little bit of opposition to this, voiced by your colleagues uh, to your left, and I wonder, I'm aware of that, that was a little understatement there. Um, I want you to explain again and answer their criticisms of what they raise. They say it's not going to help consumers and it's going to uh, hurt innovation. How do you answer that? Sure. Well, thank you. Um, so this guy uh, was a commissioner on the Federal Communications Commission when I said that TiVo was God's machine. That same guy in that same year dissented from the FCC's decision 
to impose an integration ban for two simple reasons. One, it was clearly not compelled by the statute in, in any way, in shape, or form. What was compelled by the statute was to make sure uh, that third-party boxes could get access to the signal by descrambling that signal through a separate security requirement. That I wholeheartedly endorsed then. Uh, I continue to wholeheartedly endorse now. Um, the second part was problematic because we believe, my belief then and my belief now was uh, it took away uh, an innovative third option for consumers, which is a lower cost box with integrated security that would buy FCC data, cost $50 per box less, cost consumers less, and be substantially more energy efficient. Um, uh, many cable companies have been forced to attempt to seek waivers in order to deploy new and innovative uh, uh, boxes, including new software-centric systems. Um, those waivers have often taken uh, up to two years. Ms. Burdick, um, it's expensive to run a TV station or a newspaper in this day and age. I think it would be difficult to make it work, but successful companies with proven track records have con continued to do so and do it well. Doesn't it make sense to allow good companies with good resources to put their expertise to work in failing stations or newspapers? We're talking about cross-ownership here. We're, we're talking about JSAs used appropriately, not inappropriately, but appropriately for the management. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You touched on a key point earlier, and you've echoed it again, is that the, is that the ownership regulations have not kept up for broadcast, uh, the broadcast-changing marketplace. To put it in perspective, in the small and medium markets in which we operate, we're governed basically under ownership regs that were um, enacted in 1970. And I don't know about the members of this committee, but in 1970, I was starting middle school and listening to Bridge Over Troubled Water on AM radio. The world has changed. In 1970, most broadcasters were being paid by their networks to distribute the product, and in small and medium markets, that was basically their, their profit. That has gone away. And so as that world has changed and the economics have changed, as I mentioned earlier, with people competing with us for advertising dollars, which supports 90% of our costs, 90% of our revenue in local broadcasting comes from advertising. Uh, as that pie, pie is sliced even thinner, the rules have not kept up. And so, in fact, broadcasters like Shure's have entered into some of these agreements, ours approved by the FCC, by the way, um, to create more news, more jobs, and more public service in the communities that we serve. I appreciate that. And clearly, uh, in the developing Internet world, you've got stations probably that have to compete against Internet, cable, everything else. And it just seems like these ownership rules are outdated. When Jeff Bezos can pick up the Washington Post for $250 million, or the owner of the, Boss, uh, uh, the Red Sox can pick up the Boston Globe, I I'm trying to figure out why somebody that's actually in the journalism business can't engage in that cross-ownership, too. Because the rules say we can't. And that's why the FCC should do its job and follow the law. With that, I'll turn over to the, uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I love hearings, and I, um, I, I love the, uh, um, the mix that's here, and uh, although I wouldn't refer to um, a former Chairman Powell as that guy, because uh, I think he's, I would say, great guy, uh, but here it comes. Here it comes. Uh, I, I have two quick questions for you. The first one, uh, Mr. Powell, is um, I think it's a yes or no question. On this whole issue of the integration ban, um, uh, you had written to me last year and said that the cost is about, uh, it costs consumers roughly a billion dollars. My question is, would cable companies commit to lowering the monthly cost for consumers uh, um, that uh, pay to lease the set-top box, um, particularly those with uh, advanced uh, functionality, and print this on your customer's uh, monthly bill if the integration ban is repealed. I mean, it, 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 you know, so much of this is about money. We all know that. And um, so you don't want this anymore. You've stated your case. Are you willing to reduce the price, print it on the bill, so consumers know that there's, there's a savings to them? I think what we are willing to do is commit that that money gets invested on, uh, into the network in, in a manner that's beneficial to consumers. When we had the roundtable, which you were generous right. to host, 
Um, you will remember ACA, representative of the small cable companies, made the very compelling point that those additional expenses are expenses that could not be used by small cable companies attempting to provide faster broadband speeds, uh, an important and I think significant point. So no, I, I'm not the representative of the business judgments of exactly how the savings would be returned, but I do believe it's fair I, to You say know what? I really do be... think some thought needs to be given to that. Sure. I do. I mean, if, if in fact your, your stand on behalf of uh, 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 cable operators in the country <coughs> is what it is, and you're entitled, I mean, everyone is entitled to their view and what they want and what's going to work well for them. Uh, people that are here are, are obviously speaking uh, to their interests, which is really fair. We have to protect the public interest in all of this, try to anyway. So if it, if it's, uh, it costs consumers, as you said to me in your letter last year, one billion, uh, maybe there can be a reduction of one billion somehow. Now you described the repeal of the FCC's integration ban as a narrow fix that will not change cable operators' requirement uh, to provide uh, the cable cards. But last year in your comments before the FCC, uh, NCTA and at least one of your member companies argued that because of the Echo Star case, uh, cable operators are no longer required to provide or support cable cards to retail to devices. So my question is, which is it? I, I because that's a two different, distinctly different arguments. I, I would argue our position is consistent. Um, one of the I knew you'd say that, but I, I uh, thought you might. But they're not, though. I thought not. I mean, you said something else uh, well, to if, the FCC, um, and um, you know. It's important to note that the, what, what the court found offensive about the FCC rules was it didn't believe it had the authority to apply them to satellite companies. Um, cable companies had actually, through an MOU, developed the rules. We were the only industry segment, including this guy, um, who uh, intervened to defend the rules in court. When the court, when the rules were overturned because the court said the commission didn't have the ability to apply them fairly to both satellite and cable, mm -hmm. uh, TiVo and other companies filed asking them to be applied just yeah. to cable. Now I, I, I want to go to thank you very much. Uh, to Mr. Zinn and to Mr. Wood, thank you for being here and for your testimony. Um, uh, last month, uh, most members of this uh, subcommittee voted for legislation that permits consumers to unlock their wireless phones so they can be used on any carrier's uh, network. Uh, my question to both of you is, isn't this what Section 629 and the integration ban is trying to do? I mean, I, I, obviously, it's a softball question. But I think uh, members need to do some integrating here in terms of how they have voted on the floor. And uh, uh, it's, it, doesn't this unlock the cable set-top box? Is there a reason to treat video devices differently from wireless devices? No, I mean, that's a very astute point. I'd first like to thank, um, thank you for your uh, unwavering support for consumer choice in set-top boxes and your leadership on this issue since 1996. It's very important to consumers, and there are a lot of consumers um, who thank you every day because they love the choice that they have by having uh, access to TiVo. What Congress is trying to do in terms of unlocking cell phone is to give consumers a choice of providers to use with their phone. And Section 629 is seeking the same result. Give consumers a choice of both equipment and networks rather than having to take the lowest common denominator set-top box that your provider wants to lease you. So I'd say there's no difference. Yes, thank you very much. Just very quickly, I would say they're very much the same principles and creating choices for people rather than restricting them to what their provider offers. So there's some technical and legal distinctions, of course. I think the important thing to note, too, at the outset is about the cost. I, I would say that was a no. Obviously, Mr. Powell is not in a position to promise that companies that are his members will lower their prices, but we heard that that would not necessarily lead to lower prices. And I think that that estimate of a billion dollars a year, too, or of the cost of a cable card is actually based on 2008 data, if I'm not mistaken mm -hmm. on that. So I think that the costs are also in dispute here, let alone whether those savings would be passed on to actual cable customers. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind yeah. that if, if the cable industry has spent a billion dollars um, on cable card, which, as Matt said, is based on 2008 data before the integration ban really went into effect and there was mass production, I mean, it's hard to believe that this card this little hunk of metal, unless it's made of gold, costs $56. Probably. But the bigger point is, 
over the past seven years, cable operators have billed consumers $50 billion to lease set-top box equipment. Okay, seven Chairman million, Reynolds. seven billion dollars a year for Gentle seven years. <coughs> Gentleman's time has expired, or the gentle lady's time has expired. Mr. Right. Chairman, I, I just want to say that I will submit my questions to both uh, uh, Mr. Palkovic and uh, Ms. Burdick in writing, and I thank you. Perfect. Thank you for testifying. Thank you to all of you. Thanks, gentle lady. We'll now recognize the gentle lady from Tennessee, the vice chair of the full committee, Ms. Blackburn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses. Um, Ms. Burdick, I want to come to you. Now, your company is called Shures, right? Yes. Okay, great. And you own broadcast TV stations? Yes. And radio stations? Yes. Okay. Do you require compensation for the retrans of your broadcast TV stations? Yes. Okay. And compensation for the copyright of original content that you produce? We. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Does Shures compensate the copyright holders of content it uses for its broadcast TV stations? I, I think you're asking, as you did last time I was here, about radio and the compensation of radio. I'm artists. asking for a yes or no. Yeah. Ask the question again, if you wouldn't mind. Do you compensate the copyright holders of content it uses for broadcast yes. on your TV stations? Okay. Do you pay a performance right for the music that you broadcast over your radio stations? We pay ASCAP and BMI and CSAT. That's not the question that I ask you. The answer is no. Mm -hmm. Ms. Burdick? That's correct. That's correct. You're yeah, right. The, the, the answer, answer is no. Is no. correct. You're right. And if you can provide a constitutional justification for that inconsistency, God bless your heart, because I have to tell you, there is not one, and it is intellectually inconsistent, and I think that you are fully aware of that. Okay, in your testimony, you state that retrans consent negotiations are free market negotiations, and that the major network broadcast content is the most sought after and valuable content today. You then go on to advocate for our nation's 22-year-old regulatory structure dictating the terms of these negotiations. So how is it possible that, in fact, free market negotiations, as you say, if we live under a regulatory structure that dictates to one party details like where your stations must appear on the cable lineup? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the questions. I appreciate your passion on some of these issues. I guess I would look back in researching this, and, and I went back into history. Um, the first report and order of the FCC on what was then cable antenna television said one important thing that is carried through and Congress has supported in every iteration of its action, and that is, is that CATV should carry local stations because it supplements, not replaces, local stations, and non-carriage is inherently contrary to the public interest. For all of the things that we've talked about, the floods in your district this year, Internet didn't make up for the service that local broadcasters provide. We provide an inherent and important public service that is not replicated anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, no one is arguing about the public service. What I'm asking you is about free market negotiations. And you say you own the most valuable and sought after content. Then why do you need this archaic regulatory structure? Wouldn't a pay TV provider negotiate to place your content on their basic tier if it is indeed the most sought after programming? Yeah, and I guess I didn't make my point clearly, but the point is, is that when the basic tier requirement was enacted, it was because Congress thought it important to preserve the values of localism and to require that local televisions be seen by all consumers and placed on that basic tier, and we believe that today. Well, I admire that you are um, desiring to move to parity and deregulation and uh, work toward that. And I, uh, I know you're going to continue along, along that vein. Um, let me ask you this. In your opinion, would true regulatory parity in the video marketplace allow you the freedom to negotiate like non-broadcast owners? 
You know, we have said in the context of this bill that we would embrace a wholesale view of the ownership and the deregulatory and regulatory versus deregulatory issues that affect the video marketplace. Unfortunately, most of the things that we have been discussing only benefit one side of the table, not the other. And so that's why we support a, a holistic review of the ownership rules and the rules under which we operate today. Can you envision a world in which you're treated like a cable company? You know, I guess I'll go to Jay Carney's line of the last couple of days. I'm always hesitant to predict the future. All right, fair enough. I yield back. Thank you very much. The general lady yields back, and the chair now recognizes for five minutes the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the uh, witnesses for your testimony. Uh, I'm glad to see that provisions included in this uh, draft bill that address joint negotiations uh, of the retransmission consent. Uh, I believe these negotiations can cause anti-competitive behavior and uh, can lead to incre increased prices paid by consumers. So I'm glad to see that the issue is at least being addressed in the draft bill uh, and is being addressed by Chairman Wheeler, Wheeler at the FCC. Uh, Mr. Powell, let me ask you, do you think the exemptions in Section 3 of the draft bill that allows for joint retransmission consent are necessary, uh, or do you think they detract from the goal of this provision? I, I think our view is the practice of joint negotiations is of great concern. The exception attempts to exempt companies that are genuinely owned. Um, the practical challenge there is if somebody own, literally owns both stations, Hard to imagine they're not privy to all the same information as a joint negotiator, though we would be more than happy for those not to be permitted either. Um, I do think the companion efforts by Chairman Wheeler in the context of good faith to address uh, undue power among top four station is a valuable complement to the statute. Mr. Wood, how about you? I think that's right. I think that, as, as uh, Mr. Powell said, that you can have a situation where even if you prohibit explicit joint negotiations at the table, if you have a single entity that has the books and has the power to control the activities of both stations, it will have much more leverage and much more view into what the two agreements say. So we certainly think that there are some competitive harms that aren't necessarily addressed completely by Section 3, and that's why we're looking also to the FCC to look further into the practice. Mr. Wood, let me ask you, you and uh, others point out in your testimony that the FCC will consider changing the way it attributes ownership of broadcast stations based on joint operation and service agreements. Section 4 of the draft bill would force the FCC to complete its quadrennial review in advance of modifying these types of rules. Uh, what do you think the effect of this provision would be on the FCC's ability to make rules in this area? Well, we think it would be harmful, and I don't disagree with Chairman Malden's statement that, of course, the FCC should complete its quadrennial review. It has that obligation, and we've called on it to do that in a data-driven data -driven fashion several times, not only to look at the changing business models over time, but the harms of media consolidation and of undue concentration at the local level. However, we see Section 4 as prohibiting the FCC from enforcing its rules today and going after violations of its multiple ownership rules. Chairman Walden also talked about the appropriate use of these agreements. There can be some synergies and some savings if back office operations are combined for sure. But what we're most, most concerned about are operational control, de facto transfer of control, where you have one station that's not only calling all the shots for the other, but producing the news, uh, has every right to buy the station. It really has full control over its partner and its sidecar company, as they're sometimes called. Thank you. I, I want to give Mr. Burdick a, a chance to also comment on that. I take it you might not agree. Th thank you, Mr. Doyle. <laughs> um, two points. First of all, in the joint negotiation, you're talking about one side of the negotiation equation and not the other. Cable companies also link their negotiation strategies through consultants, or the ACA basically advises its members to employ the same law firm that has access to all the data. So let's, let's be fair in our approach when we talk about the negotiations, number one. But number two, on the, JS, on the JSA SSA issue, um, free press particularly will often repeat fiction as fact. It doesn't make it so. And in fact, many of these operations extend local news and public service that would not exist. Very quickly, in 2009, Shures had a station, the only one we own that is not number one in its market, that lost money for 12 years after launching a full complement of of news. We could no longer in the recession year support it through our other operations. We had two choices, go out of business in news 
and just become an entertainment provider or enter into an agreement that preserved and added news with another entity, which is what we did. Thank you very much. Uh, and my last question, Mr. Zinn, uh, TiVo provides a competitive set-top box product that competes with set-top uh, boxes provided by the MPVDs. Uh, from your perspective, what has been the value of competition to consumers in the set-top box marketplace, and how has cable card failed to deliver that experience, and what reforms do you think need to be made to the program? Uh, there's a lot in those three questions. Um, the value of competition in set-top box marketplace is a very good question. Of course, you can't quantify exactly what the value would be, but if you look at other markets in the United States, you see, uh, you know, you look at phone, wireless, personal computing, you can get a sense of what competition brings, and that is innovation, choice, jobs, and lower costs for consumers. In the set-top box market, you can just look at what TiVo, one little company, has been able to accomplish. We invented the DVR. We were the first to bring Amazon over-the-top services to the television. We were the first to integrate internet services with cable services and one user interface. We were the first to allow you to move content from your television to your computer and mobile devices. Um, and we're on the cusp of an IP transition in video and all the innovation that that can release. And really what we're looking for here, if cable wants to move on from cable card and it's not energy efficient and it's too expensive, we say, great, just give us another solution that we can use to provide competition to consumers. Obviously, if the cable industry wants to get away from cable card, they've got something in mind. So just share it. And so my, my point here is share. You know, will you share the solution? Will you do that? Um, you know, in terms of the current regime, there have been multiple failures. There was, a, first of all, there was a failure of the FCC not to ensure that retail boxes out of the gate had access to all cable content. So right, you know, right out of the gate, retail boxes were put at a competitive disadvantage. Then there was a failure by uh, the FCC that the cable card standard was not competently supported by cable operators. And the integration ban, which is really a light regulatory touch, designed to just make sure if the cable industry is using the same security standard as retail, they're going to support it, right? Otherwise, they have no incentive to support it, and, it, and we have 10 years of evidence on that. Mr. Powell can dispute that, but the evidence is in the record. And then the I'm third sorry, failure... I'm sorry, the uh, gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Chairman, thanks for your indulgence. Thanks very much. Gentleman yields back. And at this time, uh, the chair recognized himself for five minutes. And uh, interesting enough, uh, Mr. Powell, I think I'll start with you. <laughs> but uh, again, thank you very much for uh, testifying uh, today. And you know, one of the things that uh, has been out there, if the integration ban is eliminated for lease top boxes, is the cable uh, industry still going to support cable cards? A absolutely. A couple quick things to say. First of all, it's important to remember that even if Congress passed this provision eliminating the integration ban, we would have absolute legal obligation to continue to provide separate security and cable cards. Unless you believe we just completely flaunt the law with no consequences at the Commission, that will continue to be the case. Secondly, we have 44 million subscribers of our own who use cable cards. Failure to support them and fail to support those consumers will have dire competitive consequences, particularly since our principal competitors are a collection of industries that have none of those requirements and are able to offer competitive alternatives if we fail to deliver an adequate experience. Second, the third thing I think is important for the community to understand is uh, the majority of revenue today that TiVo derived and the majority, uh, and as their CEO has noted, they have deals with 10 of the top 20 cable companies. The majority of what they're doing is providing cable boxes through cable companies. Those deals with com small companies like Suddenlink and others mean that they have to continue to support that as their principal cable equipment. So we think the incentives remain strong to comply with the law uh, that we have a duty to abide by. So uh, with, the, with the language in the draft right now, is uh, uh, Section 629 uh, repealed with the language uh, from my uh, section uh, dealing with the uh, integration ban? Absolutely not. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I, I had the privilege of sitting on the Commission during implementation of Section 629. I think the thing that troubled us at the time, that troubles us today, is that this was not in any way a requirement of the statutory provision uh, and an elimination of an FCC rule 
in this context does not in any way affect the other provisions of the statute. Thank you. Uh, going on, um, how is the cell phone unlocking different from Section 629? Well, I, I, I giggle a little bit because the analogy is completely uh, inept. Um, the third-party box... Thanks. <laughs> it was from this guy. Um, I mean, the, 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 with all respect, here's the difference. The, it's not an accurate analogy because the third-party set-top box, in essence, comes unlocked. Nothing locked about it. The, the cable card is what allows you to put it into the box and have it work. It's important to remember cable boxes and cable systems have no reason. They can't work on any other system. A Comcast box does not work in a Time Warner cable system. They're unlike the portability of cell phones or the portability of other devices that are trying to change networks. Leased boxes never change networks. The boxes that do change networks are third-party boxes, and they are unlocked, and that's what the cable card provides. And let me, uh, let me just continue on. Uh, some, some have raised concerns that the elimination of the integration ban will greatly harm consumer choice, thwart, thwart uh, competition, and seriously damage the retail market for set-top boxes and remove incentives for cable to develop a new generation solution or IP standard that's compatible with competitive navigation devices. How would you address those claims? I think the one thing we have to take real cognizance of is there has been an explosion uh, of video devices and new content sources that were hardly imagined in 1996 uh, or 1998 when these provisions were implemented. Uh, the list is legion. Uh, Roku, Apple TV, Xbox, Voodoo services, Netflix services, uh, all the iOS devices, all the Android devices, all of which are platforms today for distributing video content, including uh, cable content. That market is being developed by the marketplace at an extraordinarily fast clip. Uh, our, our view is that market innovation is, is moving to meet demand, is moving to make consumer preferences, and doesn't need an additional intervention um, in order to make it succeed. You know, when you talk about things moving quickly over the last several years, you know, if you go back just 10 years to where we are today, what would you say on the innovation side has really transpi uh, transpired in that period of time, and where do you think in the next maybe five to ten years we're going to be? I think it's completely unimaginable. When you, when you, my opinion is we're only in this third or fourth inning uh, of the transformational power of the Internet, and I think the ability to reduce video content to bits of zeros and ones and distribute them over any existing data infrastructure or any existing data-capable devices means our old-fashioned ways of looking things in in, in stovepipe ways are going to be eliminated, and consumers are going to be, I think, the great winner, um, even if it's a stress for many of our companies. Well, thank you very much. And my time has expired, and I yield back. And the chair now recognizes Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the, uh, uh, the, the hearing and appreciate all the witnesses. You know, there's a lot of good things uh, that are happening. There's the, the, the programming's never been better. That's what most people say, and a lot of my constituents say. Uh, the choices have never been wider, uh, but the cost has never been higher. That's the, the real challenge. And that's the, what I'm hearing about from a lot of folks uh, in Vermont, and I know that's true for all of us here. And the consumer just doesn't have much control uh, other than to just uh, go, uh, pull a plug, which is not what we want them to face. And I'm wondering just quickly, is there anything in the satellite reauthorization bill that's going to start addressing the cost which according uh, to the FCC statistics is going up about twice the rate of inflation every year. Just quickly, is there anything each of you can answer that? And briefly, because I don't want to take all my time on this, Mr. Palkovic. Sure. On behalf of DirecTV, there's a very important change here, and that's uh, dealing with the joint uh, negotiation of, of, of stations that are not commonly owned okay. to negotiate retransmission. Ms. Burdick? That greatly. Uh, we remain free and over the air at all times. So the consumers have always had the choice to get us for free. Well, wait a minute. But you get involved in the retransmission, too, and that adds to the cost to the consumer, right? Um, all broadcasters in a market combined don't earn what ESPN alone earns. Well, that isn't exactly responsive. It's, we I mean, I'm, you know, uh, eBay makes more than some broadcasters. 
eBay makes my, what you My point is that true, it, true. And your answer was not an answer. Either. It, was yeah. a, it was a good answer, <laughs> Thank you. but not a responsive answer. Yeah. We, ha we have an opportunity to negotiate the value in the, in the free marketplace with cable and satellite providers that are much bigger than we are. We don't earn okay. what the viewership would suggest we right, should earn. I don't have much time, so let me go. Mr. Powell, anything? Uh, in that? I, I would you. just agree with uh, Mr. Palkovic on the JSAs. I do think the Department of Justice has explicitly found that, they, that these practices result in higher prices for consumers. And I won't repeat my comments, but my okay. belief that the integration ban has that virtue as well. Thank you. Mr. Zinn? I think Mr. Powell clearly stated that consumers aren't going to see any benefit uh, monetarily from an uh, integration ban repeal. Okay, Mr. Wood? I would agree with Mr. Palkovic and, and Mr. Powell that the JSA ban, if implemented correctly, could, or I'm sorry, the joint negotiation ban could reduce okay. costs. I do think, though, giving people choice over which channels they pay for would do even more to do that, and that's why we supported Ms. Eshoo's bill and Ms. Lofgren's bill on that subject. Okay, thank you. And by the way, I understand that this bill is not all about that. It's really just trying to maintain a status quo and level playing field with some modest changes. Uh, one of the other questions I have uh, is this to Mr. Powell. I understand the NCTEA supports the eliminating the retransmission consent um, stations from the basic must-buy tier, uh, must tier, and I know there's a dispute on that. And I just want you to speak to that and then perhaps Ms. Burdick. Um, just briefly, it is the position of NCTA that must-buy has outlived its usefulness and is a provision ripe for repeal um, for the reasons that I think we've heard expressed uh, here by the committee today. Okay. Ms. Burdick. I find it interesting that cable likes to talk about tiering only when it's with broadcast stations and not other programming. Well, there's a, there's a kind of a, a it, you, I think, quite accurately pointed out how things are totally different now. But, you know, most people used to get the, the, the big network broadcast for free. And now if they get packaged with the, most people, half the Vermonters get all of their uh, signals through satellite or cable, and then what they were could still get for free with an antenna, they don't get for free, and if that gets bundled up, I think that's the point you're making, isn't it, Mr. Powell? Yeah, I, I would only add, we, ha we have to be candid that th this is the only class of program to which the government, by law, requires an American consumer to purchase as a predicate to anything else the consumer might want. That just is a difference of substantial magnitude to any right. other kind of commercially negotiated package. And that, that was actually, as I heard uh, Ms. Blackburn's question, the tone of her question, she was kind of getting to that, uh, that situation. But I just want to say I, I appreciate you all coming in. I mean, this is so important to the economy and to consumers. Uh, but, and we're not going to be able to deal with this now. The changes that you've described that have occurred are enormous. The programming, everyone is saying, has never been better, and obviously there's got to be a financing mechanism that is going to support the infrastructure and the creative content. But bottom line, we've got to have some provisions in here that address the, the consumer uh, and their inability to be at the table by and large uh, when these very important negotiations with very legitimate competing interests are taking place. So going forward, I just uh, implore all of you to remember that even as you make uh, compelling arguments for the interests that you represent that are important to consumers, uh, that the outcome here be something that uh, is going to slow this rate of growth that's going at twice the rate of inflation. And I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes for five minutes the gentleman from Louisiana. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to, uh, to start with Ms. Burdick, and uh, let me first say I, I've always felt uh, that broadcasters should be compensated uh, for their content, uh, for the programming that you provide. Uh, where we probably disagree is uh, where I don't believe every single cable subscriber should be mandated by the federal government uh, to buy what, what anyone else might be selling. That's, that's something that two parties should be negotiating, not the federal government coming in and saying, you have to do this this way. Let, let, let the parties get in the room, and you all have negotiations, but I, I guess where my issue has been is that uh, in many cases there are federal mandates that, that set the stage for how those negotiations even begin. And so with that, I, my question would be, uh, do you think it's fair that the federal government mandates that cable subscribers, you know, in my district, uh, the average household income is around $45,000. And so, you know, should those people be required by law to buy broadcast programming uh, and as well as the other programming that, you know, maybe three or four or five other stations along with it, uh, rather than just 
letting it be a free market negotiation between two parties? Uh, you know, I think we've always expressed a willingness to, be, uh, to enter and be engaged in those discussions. But as I said in my testimony, broadcasters have um, regulations that other people don't. And with that and some public service obligations came some benefits. That was one of the benefits. And in every in invaluable every, spectrum that goes along with it, I know you have mandates there. Well, I uh, paid for have, my spectrum. Satellite got theirs for free too. So I mean, I th I think it, you can have an intellectual argument, but you need to take a wholesale look and not just pieces that are in this bill. Right, and I would agree. That's why I, I do think we need to take that wholesale view of this. And you know, we're starting that conversation in this Stella Reauth, which you know we'll, we'll get into maybe later. There's never been a clean Stella bill, so clearly we're starting to have some of those conversations and trying to trying to start leveling that scale, but clearly we've got a long way to go to get to a true level negotiation. And, and now the, the broader discussion will, will occur after we're, we're removed with this conversation. And, and I think the chairman of both the full and subcommittee agree that we have to have a broader discussion on that. Um, I guess it brings me to you, Mr. Powell. Um, it's one thing for both parties in the negotiation uh, to, to arrive at a tiering plan or, or channel packaging, and that's something you know, I sure think that should, should be a negotiation that, that y'all enter into. Uh, you know, but right now it's a different dynamic where the government's mandating. That's how you have to walk out of the room uh, if you have that negotiation. And, you know, one of the, the things that we've been starting to highlight is, you know, when you look at the 92 Cable Act and some of the things your companies have to deal with, uh, you know, I, I, love, I love this brick phone because it, it, it underscores just the point that the law was written at a time when this was your smartphone. This was the main telecommunications device and and so when we think about these laws I think it's always important to go back and say these laws were written when this was the smartphone of the day uh, this was the most telecommunications power you could put in and now of course uh, the things you could put into this little device you can actually stream video you can pull up programs that were on TV last night uh, I still have not you, you still to use that. that is that still I've tried to I've tried to get an arrangement where I could at least get some kind of uh, signal on this thing and then for some reason it doesn't work but unfortunately the laws don't work either because the laws were written when this was device they've updated this device by the way and, and you can go through about 50 different iterations to this device yet we don't have any iterations of updating of the laws that still govern how things operate so i want to ask you mr powell how do your companies uh deal with uh, a legal environment that was written and still functions today under laws that were based on this technology uh, when today you're competing in a world with this technology? Yeah, I, I, just in short, I think it's, it's, it's challenging because the market reality, the facts of not only the products, but the market structures, who are your competitors, what are your innovative choices, um, all are things that when layered over the statute, which is at best ambiguous uh, because it's not clearly applicable or appreciable compared to what's really happening. And, and it leads to a lot of delay. The one thing that I would argue that it does quite aggressively create uncertainty and delay. Things that should be done quickly on internet, and internet time now take years sometimes of, of resolution at the commission just because of a, a, a statute that doesn't imagine the changed technical circumstances of the market. So it's challenging. Um, they do their best to work around those ambiguities. Um, and I don't think we are even here to say that deregulation for its own sake is even the answer. But law should at least honestly and accurately reflect the reality of the marketplace it's purporting to oversee. And when that is as badly out of alignment uh, as some of these rules are, I think it's certainly time uh, to, to, to reevaluate their their. Yeah, and I think, I think it's pretty clear that the time for reevaluation is long past. Again, I've been through, fortunately, multiple different phones when I went from this. I actually couldn't afford one of these when I was a college student. But... Uh, uh, with a lot of college students, and in fact, my, my six-year-old daughter has one of these, and she knows how to use it probably better than me. Uh, but if you look at the iterations of growth and innovation between these two devices, it just shows you how outdated the current laws are that Congress hasn't gone and revised and updated those laws since this was the device. Long past time that we do it. I'm glad we're at least starting that conversation, uh, putting a little bit of those concepts in Stella, but knowing that longer term, the bigger issues have to be confronted, and they've got to be confronted soon if we're going to benefit consumers, who are the people that we represent. It's the people that all of you service in your lines of business. So I look forward to that broader discussion as we get through this, and uh, appreciate the Thank chairman you. and Ms. Eshoo's efforts as well, and uh, we'll continue working forward to get to that goal. Yield back the balance one time. We appreciate you bringing that black and white TV with you. Yeah. Um,
<laughs> we'll now turn to a uh, gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. DeGette, for Thank five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to suggest that, given the topic of this bill, maybe Mr. Scalise would like to bring in his TV from that era the next time he comes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I want to add my thanks to the Chairman for... Um, uh, it, for issuing a discussion draft and trying to work in a bipartisan way on this bill. It's always been a bipartisan bill, and while we have some concerns about it, I think we can all work together to bring it to a markup. There's a couple of issues that I want to talk about today. The first one is blackouts, because we've all been talking about how our consumers feel, and um, we've been having a lot of Americans don't really understand what Stella is or retransmission consent, but they can clearly see what happens when negotiations break down and there's a blackout. Um, the, and I will tell you, if, if the Bronco games got blacked out, I would hear universally from all of my constituents in, in Denver and the surrounding vicinity. Um, we've heard from witnesses representing all parts of the video marketplace that blackouts are unfair to consumers and on behalf of the consumers, I agree. I think we need to talk um, as we look at reauthorization, and I'm happy to see the diversity of opinions today about what we can do um, as we look at the reauthorization to consider the impact on that growing problem. So I want to start with you, Mr. Powell, and, and ask you if you think Section 3 of the draft legislation would make blackouts more or less common for consumers. I personally believe it's a useful step to making them less of a problem for consumers. Um, Ms. Burdick, what's your view on that? Um, I, I said when I was here last time that, you know, we've agreed to support the draft because I think, frankly, it's um, kind of a stocking horse in the, we do 100 agreements every cycle. In one time in 10 years has an MVPD asked for separate negotiation. And when asked again the next time, they said it's more efficient to do it together. We, uh, we've said all along, if they want to do them separately, they can. So you, It so will add cost. It will add time, particularly to smaller broadcasters. And that, but, those but costs to, will have to, to be passed to, to reiterate my question, do you think Section 3 would make blackouts more or less common for consumers? I appreciate your you're being, yeah. being part of the team. I what, think the negotiations are still going to be tough, particularly when you're the small guy. Do you think blackouts will be more or less common, Ms. Burdick? I, I have no way to gauge it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Palkovic? Uh, they will be less, significantly less. There's no question about it. Okay. Um, are there, are there, well, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I want to talk for a minute about um, shared service agreements. I'm pleased that the draft bill is recognizing that we should not permit broadcaster coordination for retransmission consent, but shared service agreements also have an uh, impact on jobs and local news. And so if we can all agree that broadcaster cooperation can harm competition, it seems inconsistent that then in the bill we would tie the FCC's hands and present, prevent the agency from addressing these harms outside the retransmission consent product. So, uh, Ms. Burdick, I want to ask you, the National Association of Black Journalists recently wrote the FCC supporting Chairman Wheeler's proposal on shared sh service agreements. They said many of the stations that are now part of a shared service agreement had working news departments with journalists who covered local news. Those news departments were closed for various reasons, disrupting the lives and careers of the affected journalists. How do you respond to that allegation by the um, National Association of Black Journalists? Yeah, I think they've changed their position because they have since sent a letter um, indicating that they have, have come around the bend on that issue because they've seen the fact that minority ownership is, is ending. Um, I can speak for our company's experience, and I mentioned the Augusta experience where our choice was only going out of the local news business or entering into agreement. We have two others, one in Kansas, represented by people here today, where we began news in Spanish with a JSA with Univision. It's the only local newscast in Spanish, does emergency alerts and weather warnings in the state of Kansas. The second is in Springfield, Missouri, where we took a number four failing by almost any measure station. That's DTV transition solution was a 15-watt transmitter, 15-watt 
Um, with a local businessman, we entered into a JSA. That station is now competitive for number two and won the National Edward R. Murrow Award for Best Local Newscast last Thank year. Thank you. Mr. Wood, how would you respond to this so we can get your, your opinion on the record as well? Well, more than one witness has used the word fiction, and I think there have been a lot of stories told in both directions. I think the problem we've had till now is that JSAs are just one tactic that broadcasters use to coordinate, and as Chairman Walden said, when it's inappropriately done, when it actually harms competition, and that is both in terms of retransmission and also in terms of the newscast that we see and other diversity of viewpoints and competing viewpoints that we need, that's when we're concerned, when there's a de facto transfer of control and you actually have one station airing the same news on two or three or four channels in a market. We've documented several examples of that, and we think the Federal Communications Commission needs to look into that practice to see when there's actually a transfer of control happening and shared news rather than just shared advertising. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have this letter from the Association of Black Journalists. It's dated March 10th, 2014. Can I correct myself? You're right. I'm wrong. Okay. It was the, it was the black-owned broadcaster. Okay. Uh, I'd, like, I, I'd like unanimous consent to put the March 10th letter into the record. Without to objection. Any confusion. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time's expired. We'll now go to the gentleman from Missouri, I believe, is next. Mr. Long for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all for being here today and for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Burdick, you discussed earlier uh, today the uh, competition in the local markets for advertising. You had a chart you put up on the wall. Uh, I know that the Department of Justice recently put together a paper for the Federal Communication Commission detailing the leverage that broadcasters have in local markets. And what, how's your take on that? How's your analysis stack up against what Department of Justice recently found in their finding? Yeah, I think there are three, and thank you for the question, Congressman Long. I think there are three key points in that DOG, DOJ filing. First of all, large sections of it were lifted from 1997 dealing with radio, the radio JSAs. They were out of date and they were inaccurate. Number two, it never mentioned cable in the document at all, as if cable did not compete with local broadcasting for advertising. And I think this committee's own data suggests that a cable system, one cable system in a market is the equivalent to about a number two or a number three television station. It mentioned, didn't even mention the word cable, much less internet or any of the other new advertising sources. And probably most disingenuous, as far as I'm concerned, is in its footnote, the DOJ noted that it itself had reviewed several complaints of alleged anti-competitive activity and found that not to be the case and encouraged a case-by-case -case review, but then in its conclusion basically came up with a bright line, ban all JSAs. Uh, I thought it was sloppy. I thought it was disingenuous. And I don't think it should be relied on as a document of fact. Okay. Thank you. Uh, also, for you, Ms. Burdick, in the draft Stella bill, it contains a provision eliminating the sweeps rule. And uh, can you explain to me exactly how that rule works and what the potential impact on smaller stations and smaller markets would well, be? Well, I, I, I think you've rightly hit on a point that most people have um, not recognized, and that is the impact on smaller markets. Many of our members of NAB don't like it. We've said we could support and would live with the compromise in this legislation. But the distinction is that larger markets, usually markets 60 and above, are, are always in sweeps. They're metered markets. Diary markets, 60 and below, are rated four times a year. And basically, their advertising and their economics are set three times a year. And this was enacted because of documented mischief from the cable, from the cable side uh, in history where they were preemptively taking broadcasters off the air during sweeps so their rates and their advertising um, economics would be negatively impacted. But we've said we can live with it, um, and we would support that change in the bill. But there is a distinction with local markets, and I appreciate you raising it, smaller markets. Okay, thank you. And I've got to say earlier when Mr. Zinn was making reference to Mr. Powell next to him and uh, said, this guy, and then Mr. Powell reached over and picked up his cup. I thought we were going to have a Jerry Springer moment for a minute, but uh, <laughs> thankfully he was just going for a drink of water. So I yield back, Mr. Mother Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of time. We turn to the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope we don't have a Jerry Springer moment here. I don't think that the committee could handle that. 
Uh, Ms. Burdick, I once tried a case in the Quentin Burdick Courthouse in Fargo, North Dakota. Are you at all related to Senator Burdick? You know, I asked my husband that. Yeah. As far as I know, although that family is from that North Dakota, South Dakota border, we don't think so. Well, it's a lovely courthouse if you ever get to yes. Fargo. And there's a Burdick Highway. It is. Um, I, I'm glad that the committee is moving forward on a reauthorization of Stella. Uh, and I want to be open to all the stakeholders who have an interest in this reauthorization. And so I have a very simple question for each one of you. I know it's been a long hearing, but I want to ask each of you if there was one thing you could change about the discussion draft to improve it, what would it be? And I'll start with you, Mr. Wood, and we'll just work our way down the table. I would simply remove Section 4 and give the FCC the power to look into these agreements so that they can make the data-driven rules that we all know they need to have in this day and age. Thank you. Mr. Zinn? I would eliminate the 629 am <clears throat> amendment. Um, if you look back, at, if you step back, this is Stella legislation designed to provide distant signals to 1.5 million unserved satellite customers. But it's been hijacked to disenfranchise a million people who are using retail devices. And this committee is not one to pick winners and losers. Um, and, you know, I would take that out. Mr. Powell? Uh, I think we would just continue to work with the committee to make sure that the JSA provisions are sufficiently tight, that they don't undermine uh, the ability for the commission to look at this issue in the narrow area of retransmission consent. Thank you. Ms. Burdick? Yeah, thank you for the question. My change would be if there are going to be requirements that govern how one side of the table can, broadcasters can negotiate retransmission consent, that similar agreements on the MVPD side also be looked at. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Pavlov. Uh, yeah, we are very happy with the way the bill is drafted today. If we were going to change anything, we probably want it to be a little bit stronger on, uh, on the blackout issue. So there, there, there's no way that people can blackout channels. Well, I appreciate all of your succinct answers, and I will treat you with the similar courtesy and yield back the balance of my time. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. gentlemen, for yielding back. Uh, I'm going to yield, before I go to Ms. Uh, Elmers, the, uh, to the ranking uh, uh, Democrat here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to ask for a unanimous consent request to place in the record uh, the Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism, which uh, demonstrates the uh, amount of healthy revenues uh, that are reported relative to local broadcast TV advertising revenue and its growth. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady. And before I yield to uh, uh, Ms. Elmers, I'm just curious if, 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 if Mr. Bur Ms. Burdick and Mr. Powell, on this issue of the sweeps and the, uh, the market size, um, we're not trying to do violence to somebody. Is that an issue, Mr. Powell, that you think there you, you, could be, there's common ground maybe between these that are that are uh, metered and those that are diaried? I think we somebody? fully support the provision as it's currently drafted. Currently drafted, okay. Uh, we'll go now to uh, Ms. Elmers and uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panel for being here today on this very important issue as we take the steps forward uh, to deal with Stella. I do have some questions uh, for Mr. Um, Pelkovic that are a little more specific to uh, North Carolina, my region of the country, and having to do with um, Inspiration Network, one of the uh, independent networks. Um, it's come to my attention, Mr. Pal Palkovic, that um, there have been some negotiations and that um, DirecTV is no longer carrying uh, Inspiration TV. And um, I'm coming at this approach not only as a member of this committee, a member of Congress, but also as a mom and actually one of your customers. Um, I'm concerned about this because there seems to be a little bit of unfair dealing um, with how we deal with the independent um, networks. And, and I just was wondering if you could uh, discuss that with me, and then um, if you would be so kind as com to commit to work with my office, this committee, and um, others within the um, independent networks as well. Sure. Um, we're always happy to work with people on these kind of issues. We, we have, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of programming agreements. And some of the agreements, you know, we're paying for content. Some of the agreements, uh, the content providers pay us to be carried. Um, 
And mm -hmm. as you can probably appreciate, we don't disclose individual terms and conditions. Sure. Um, we're not um, allowed to contractually. Um, in this particular case, uh, we had a, a, a relationship with the in Inspiration Network. Uh, they did not want to continue along mm -hmm. the same lines or even similar lines uh, as their previous agreement, so they chose to take their channel down. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we're forced to take a channel down. Uh, we don't like to do it. It's, it's not in any way, shape, or form what we strive for. Uh, in this case, it happened to be their decision. Mm -hmm. um, now, our, and, and our that door, is our door is always open to them if they want to. Come and out. that is my understanding as well. Um, now, having you know, not and and our purpose is not to interfere with negotiations. Um, this, for me, again, is an issue of of fairness. Um, you know, one that I believe is very important um, in in dealing with these types of issues, especially with the appearance that it takes, you know, being that this particular network deals with family, wholesome, faith-based programming, I, I see them as possibly being discriminated against. Um, and it is my understanding, and there again, you don't have to go into details, but that actually they were paying a significant amount of money to be carried uh, by DirecTV, that cost was going to have to go up, and then within the negotiations, they said, look, we simply can't afford that, and by the way, we know that you actually carry other networks for free, and, you know, can't we negotiate that kind of a deal? And, and as you can imagine, the appearance is that they're being dealt with unfairly. Well, I can assure you our track record as a company is, uh, is just the opposite of that. We do deal with people fairly, um, and I, I won't get into the details mm -hmm. of that particular relationship. Um, but obviously we had a deal with them on acceptable mm -hmm. terms. Um, and as I said, there was discussions about continuing under similar conditions, uh, different than what you characterized or what you've been told. Um, and they chose not to. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if for some reason they want to continue discussions, again, mm -hmm. we talked to everybody and, you know, your, your comment on programming that's targeted at you know, the family program, we are a huge proponent of family programming. We have um, a, a lot of examples of that on our platform. So um, just so I can get it on the record, we, we're a big proponent of mm -hmm. family programming at DirecTV. Well, thank you. And will you commit to me um, today that we can work together on this and then bring others mm -hmm. together so that we can yeah. solve this problem? Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, gentlewoman, yield just for... Five sure, seconds. I have 37 seconds. Yeah, I, I just want to say that I'd be happy to work with you on this. And uh, Wonderful. It's, it's not negotiations, it's suggestions. And we're happy that you're open to uh, 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 what the gentlewoman spoke to. So I'd be happy thank to work you, with thank you. Thank you to the ranking member. And um, I'm looking forward to, to being able to work together on this. Thank you very much. And I yield back the remainder of my time. Channel A yields back. And that's obviously an issue a number of us have heard about. So. Yeah. Appreciate you raising that. Turn now to uh, the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Appreciate you calling and say you wanted me to come back to extend this hearing by another five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had a quick meeting I had to take, so th I'm glad it was still going on when I got back. Uh, Mr. Powell, I'm interested in, in uh, learning a little bit more about the interconnects uh, that Ms. Verdick referred to in her testimony and how that works, but do you have any additional information on joint sales of local advertising? Uh, between cable, satellite, and telcos, uh, what's your view and well, I think, perception? I think, I, would, I, I think I would say for purposes of this bill, um, it, the joint use of agreements for advertising is, has absolutely nothing to do with what, what we're here seeking support for. We're, we're, we're having a concern with the use of joint agreements as a basis for validating collective negotiation of retransmission consent. Um, not, not advertising. I don't have an opinion on whether their advertising models are efficient or not efficient um, in the sales of local advertising. What I do think is beyond efficiency and treads into the territory of anti-competitive conduct is collusively negotiating prices for retrans consent, and I don't think that bears on at all whatever the virtues or lack of them on, on local advertising markets are. Ms. Burdick. Thank you. Um, the fact of the matter is that the cable industry itself, in an ex parte filed by Nexstar in the last couple of days, they cite some specific examples where non-co-owned cable companies have linked together their negotiations with the same consultants. We have personal experience 
Um, and, and I'm not, not here to speak badly of cable. We own cable companies as well. But we have personal experience with ACA members in which they will tell us in a negotiation that they will have to run this by ACA or the ACA attorneys before they can get back to us on the acceptance of a deal. So my only point was if you're going to look at how those negotiations happen, look at it not just on the broadcast side but on the other side as, as well. And um, you know, I may be the only one in the room who finds it a little ironic that Comcast and Time Warner can merge, but two little stations in Augusta, Georgia can't talk to them about uh, their retransmission agreements, but Fair I would point. encourage you to look at both sides. So in, in, regard, uh, in regard to JSAs, uh, in calculating ownership, which I think is uh, a creative thing, uh, do you think that many broadcasters would have to unwind GSAs in order to remain compliant with local ownership caps? Uh, the, the proposal that has come out from the FCC suggests that there would have to be a hard unwind. Um, there are rules yet to be written. In our particular case, our agreement was reviewed and approved by the FCC um, in 2008, I think it was. So if now a few years later, after investing $11 million in equipment and expanding news and public service, I have to unwind, I would suggest that's a harmful thing. So the rules have yet to come out, but the suggestion is, yes, there would have to be an unwind that would lead to less news and less, less local news and less public service. Right. Mr. Wood, is there any scenario for GSAs to be not anti-competitive? If you can use two negatives. Uh, you, can, you can. I don't know if I can. Um, <laughs> As we've said, JSAs are really just the tip of the iceberg here. The FCC has a long record on them and has been studying them for a while. They've applied this rule in the radio context for several years. I want to be clear again that when we talk about synergies and eliminating back office expenses, that's jobs too. The, the same next star letter that was referred to by Ms. Burdick um, said that some of our figures were wrong, and they said of our 30 layoffs, only three of those were on-air personalities. So the other 27 people still lost jobs as well. I would say that perhaps there is some efficiency to be gained from combining back office operations. However, we're talking more about total management and control of one station by another, especially when the sidecar companies or shell companies are doing nothing but holding the license for the purpose of evading FCC rules, and not necessarily situations where you do actually have separate news teams and separate broadcasters, but where the owner, for FCC purposes of the license, is, is doing nothing but that has no office, no personnel, no control over programming, no control over leasing or any right to sell the station to anyone but Let the me ask you about this scenario then. What, what about GSAs just for, as Mr. Powell was discussing, negotiations for retransmission on either side, the cable side or the, the network sides? Mm -hmm. yeah, we've, or the we've, sta oh, station owner sides? Yes, I'm sorry. We, we've said in our filings that we want the FCC to take a look at the totality of the circumstances here. JSAs are one indicator of common control. I wouldn't say that they necessarily transferred control all by themselves, and so there could be a role for some negotiations and some sharing of resources. Another example that's commonly cited is the same two stations using a radar system or sharing the same news helicopter or something like that that's a physical asset. Our hackles are raised when they're sharing people and sharing news and sharing the same stories on two supposedly competing stations. May I answer that one quick, quickly? Certainly. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, free press starts with a false assumption that if there wasn't the sharing, that there would be a robust separate newsroom, right. and that is simply not true. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, Mr. Ladd, I believe you have something for the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to enter a letter of support for my language regarding integration ban from the League of Rural Voters. Without objection, so ordered, and I have a, a, a item uh, from the Wall Street Journal from Juan Williams I referenced in my testimony we'd like to put in the record without objection so ordered and I want to thank the witnesses and all of the participants in this hearing our members uh, this is obviously a important subject a complicated one and we're going to continue to move forward we thank you we'll probably have some uh, questions for the record uh, to clarify some issues uh, going forward but thanks for your participation and with that we stand adjourned